You know what I mean? Like, because you can hear something. Anybody can hear stuff. We hear stuff all the time. You know, I mean, information alone has never been enough to radically transform someone's life. Yeah. Never. You know. So I'm, I'm just praying, man. At some point, whether it happens there in the moment, a week from then, five years later, that God uses the information shared to really come crashing into people's hearts, yeah. like by way of revelation. You know. And we're just gonna talk about God's desire for the church. Uh, God's wisdom for the church and how he's making it the expression of wisdom in our day and age. Uh, so we'll just chop it up. And what is God doing in the church? How is, like, what is his wisdom in releasing certain truths and dynamics over the church, even in, in this day and age right now, in, in, our, in our current season? Yeah, sure. I, I think God has had a wisdom since the beginning you know, in desire for the church. Yeah. You know, when we say the word church, um, there's thousands of different experiences as to what you can mean by, hey, I went to church, or hey, I'm a part of a church, or hey, I'm looking for a church. You know, there's, there's all of this different language and experience and things that get tied into, um, you know, that help to shape people's perspective. But for me, uh, I think that when we think of church, we have to think of Jesus mm. because Jesus, in fact, was the first to release the word church. Yeah. Like we find the first reference of church, that word specifically being released from Jesus in Matthew 16. Mm -hmm. And it didn't come until they were willing to acknowledge him as king. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So Peter gets this crazy revelation, you know, which Jesus applauds. And he's like, man, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. But my father, which is in heaven, you know, for you are the son of of God, the Christ, Lord of all, the anointed one, the Messiah, right? And, yeah. and Jesus is like, upon this rock, I will build my church. Yeah. Well, you know, he wouldn't say church until they said king. Mm, come on. Yeah. So church at a fundamental level has to be people that have yielded their lives to the revelation or the revealing of this king and his kingdom. Mm. You know, but then secondly, when Jesus was asked, what are the two most important commandments? He said, love the Lord, right? With all your mind, all your strength, but then love one another, mm. you yeah. know? So like love God, yes, love God, but then also love your neighbor or love your brother yeah. or love one another. Yeah. You know, that phrase one another, there's, there's 58 one another statements in the New Testament, mm. right? So life together is unavoidable. In fact, much of the apostolic writing is dealing with issues of what happens when our lives get knit together in the way that Ephesians 2 language tells us it's supposed to be for God to have a dwelling for himself in and by the spirit. Yeah. So for me, I think God's wisdom for the church is best represented in Ephesians 3.10, mm -hmm. a body in which the manifold wisdom of God is yes. completely revealed yeah. to prophesy to powers and principalities of the air of a victory that Jesus has that the fullness is yet coming, mm. right? And so we are now co-laborers with the Spirit trying to build this family that God has been developing generation over generation to crush the powers of darkness eternally, yeah. which we know Jesus has, but to live out this victory yeah. in our lives personally and then in the lives of others as they're gathered into this family. Mm. But so a simple definition of church for me is God's family. Mm. God's family, but that family being mature, knit together, powerful in everyday life. Yeah. Yeah. By the spirit. Yeah. That's good. And committed, committed to be a member of the body, right? Committed to one another's lives. Cause we see, we, we've seen broken families and the fruit of that. And we've seen broken churches and we see the fruit of that, but being committed to be knit together that, does, that means that there will be obstacles. That means that there will be disagreements. That means that we'll, there will be trials that come up, um, come up amongst the people. Yeah. But if Jesus is king and if his lordship is supreme above every trial uh, of ever, ever testing, even our own opinions and perspectives, if Jesus is Lord, mm. he, he, when we surrender to him, he can even define and, and put matter, settle matters even within communities that bring like have even uh, different things coming against them, right? 
Yeah, you know, the, the issue of, uh, I think it's great to say, our lives knit together. Uh, because when I say church is God's family or spiritual family, that means something to me, right? That language means something specific. Yeah. Um, what that means is, is that our lives are being knit together in a life-on-life, day-to-day, week-to-week, mm-hmm. developmental, refining way that is causing us to look more like Jesus because yeah. of the issues that are coming up from within us as our lives are being knit together. Yeah. Uh, and that at times is not something that everybody is really interested in nor excited about. Mm. Because in our day, it's easier to do church because church has meant so many other things than it is to do family. Mm. It's much easier to create an order of service and to go after God and to do these types of things in a corporate meeting but you can have big time gatherings, but big time gatherings, a natural byproduct of big time gatherings is not deep, mature, strong spiritual family. Right. Yeah. Like, as a matter of fact, the one does not necessarily mean the other. Mm-hmm. Like you can create gatherings and not have family. Mm-hmm. The fact that you sit next to each other once a week, twice a week, three times a week doesn't mean that you're being knit together yeah, come on. in a covenantal accountable expression to where your lives are being developed into real spiritual family. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, we are family by foundation. Like, I get that. Like, amen. Okay, great. We're all in Christ. We're all brothers and sisters. We're family in God. Okay, awesome. We're family by foundation, but we must become family by formation. Wow. Like, Paul echoes these these sentiments. Like, yes, okay, you are family. Now become family. Mm -hmm. Right? Like the reality is something that we have to fight to preserve and actually to cultivate, to Mm. continually cultivate, to make that truth real in our hearts and in our lives. And for some, there's a lot of issues that come up whenever you try to do life with folks. Mm -hmm. And it has to be of a diverse nature. Mm. This is so important. (laughs) The gospel has to be powerful enough to create unity out of extreme diversity. Yeah. Because if you don't have extreme diversity, you have conformity. Hmm. And many have settled for all of the pieces looking the same and labeling that spiritual family Hmm. when I'm not against some of the pieces looking the same. Some will look, they will look the same, Mm -hmm. but you must have diversity. Otherwise, unity has not yet been made real. You know, it's like you can't have unity without real diversity. You have conformity. Hmm. And so when our lives get rubbed up against one another, there's a lot of issues that come up, yeah. but this is the language of the New Testament, yeah. right? This is the complications that much of the epistles are written to. Hmm. Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Ephesians, Colossians, Galatians, right? Like on and on and on. Mm-hmm. I mean, much of the Ephesians 4 language, right? Like we have the beginning, therefore, if chapters 1 through 3 are true, then walk worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Mm-hmm. Awesome. But then you have verse 3, like fight to preserve the bond of peace in the unity of the Holy Ghost. Mm-hmm. The rest of the verses deal with what it looks like when our lives begin interacting or rubbing up against one another. Yeah. Or when we do life in a covenantal way, which means I'm not just going to run yeah. the minute my preferences you know, get invaded or my feelings get hurt or somebody offends me or things don't go the way I planned for them to go. Like, no, we're in covenant for the good, the bad, and the ugly for the real forming of the image of Jesus, the glory of God resting upon families and relationships. Much of the Ephesians 4 language is what happens when life begins to be done together. Yeah. And then you have verse 30, like, so please don't quench the Holy Spirit of God. Mm. It's in a relational context. Mm. Like Ephesians 4.30 is not the charismatic secret sauce, like to preserve the quality or to preserve like our order of service. You know, it's not like, well, hey, you clapped too loud during the meeting when nobody else was clapping. (laughs) Or like, hey, you ran, you know, a lap around the building when nobody, like that's not what it's all about. That's Mm. not quenching the spirit. It's in a (laughs) relational context. Wow. Like, because in verse 31 and 32, he closes the chapter this way. Like, so please Mm. get rid of all bitter and jealousy Mm. and divisions and envy. Like, things that destroy the quality, sincerity, and integrity of our relationships. Mm. This is how we quench the spirit. Wow. 
Like by yielding our hearts yeah. to the weapons of warfare mm -hmm. that have been strategically designed in nature to destroy what it is that God is building, mm -hmm. which is the quality of spiritual family mm -hmm. that destroys the powers and principalities of the air. You can gather, you can sing, dance, run, shout, you can clap, but if your heart is filled with bitterness, <laughs> jealousy, division, yeah. like this is in Ephesians, like it's the progression of Ephesians, like the Ephesians 310, the manifold wisdom of God, prophesying to principalities and powers of the air, destroying rulers in high places of authority and darkness. You do everything you want to do externally, visibly in a gathering orientation. You don't tear down principalities mm. until you first tear down the weapons that have been strategically created mm. against the quality of what God has now made available wow. in the place of real spiritual family. Wow. It just doesn't happen, man. So you're saying that church is relation, relational, like a reality of relationship with God and with one another. Um, yes, uh, I'm saying at, at a core fundamental level church that does not look like family is not in alignment with church that is coming out of the heart of Jesus. Mm -hmm. It is yielded hearts and lives to this king and his kingdom, which looks like loving God and loving my brother. Yeah. Our lives have to be connected to God in covenant and connected to one another mm -hmm. in covenant or else it's incomplete. Yeah. Like it's incomplete. Mm -hmm. And many cases, what we believe is, um, let's say we, and not to jump too much into this, I, I don't want to make too much of this, but if we were to give them like a numerical value, right? I would say one would be, let's say, identity or intimacy. Mm. Um, we have to learn how to love God for ourselves. Nobody else can love God for you. Yeah. You've got to love God. Um, you've got to get intimate with God. You've got to develop this covenantal yielding, uh, this relational experience, this union with Jesus. Like that's got to happen for you. I, nobody can do that for you. Yeah. But then in our church culture, what we then believe is the most important step in, in, in or next important link in the chain is, okay, I've learned how to love Jesus and walk with him. Well, now what, what is the call that's on my life? Yeah. What is the activity that God wants me to be a part of? What is destiny for me? Like, what is the responsibility as far as, you know, uh, behavior or activity or what, what does God want me to do? Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't say that that's the next step in the chain. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't go identity, then calling. Mm -hmm. I would go identity, then family, mm -hmm. then calling. Yeah. Because family is the refining tool that God uses to validate all of number one's claim. Mm. And it's also the greatest instrument that God uses to authorize all of the expression of number three. Mm. Your personal intimacy will never give you an exemption from God's family. Mm. <laughs> like you don't get to be so developed in identity or intimacy that you get to bypass God's family and jump straight into some sort of church building activity mm -hmm. as ridiculous as that would sound. Yeah. Do you get what I'm saying? Like yeah. that, it, it doesn't sound right when we put it that way. That's why the necessity is yes, I have to learn how to love God, but then I have to get into real family yeah. with others that are loving God real covenantal accountability and ex uh, like um, experience where my life is rubbed up against people that are very diverse, yeah. people that I wouldn't have any other reason to be connected to, people that aren't necessarily, let's say, in the same sphere of influence or place yeah. of expression in life or responsibility, and, and I need all of that in order to refine me, in order to really make me all of what I believed I received in number one. Yeah. Because without number two, we can claim anything <coughs> we want to claim about ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like yeah. Galatians 5 gives us this list of the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit I don't need when I'm getting developed in personal identity right. and intimacy with Jesus. Right. Yeah. I don't need it when I'm alone in private with God. 
I need it when I'm out in public with you. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? For yeah. when we start to do life together yeah. and things start to come up out of me that, that I might not like or that I didn't really know was in there yeah. or that because I've been dodging family or covenantal accountability in the place of real relationship with people that are not like me of diversity and you know backgrounds and experience and sphere of influence in life, when things start coming up out of me, that, that's when I need the development of the fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. <laughs> But then once I've been refined in the trenches of real life, I now have a fuller, more authorized expression for whatever it is then that God would call me to do. Yeah. Because I've been defined and refined by family. Yeah. You know, which that's what God is doing. Yeah. He's inviting more people into the family. Yeah. Like we're baptized into the name of the Father, the Son. Like, yeah. it's familial language. Yeah. Like, in my father's house, there are many rooms. Mm -hmm. You can't escape, like, the language of family. You know? Yeah. So, so, yeah, the church that doesn't look like family to me, or the efforts of church that aren't being pointed towards the development of real, mm -hmm. mature, spiritual family, yeah. to me, I, I just, what's the point then? Yeah. You know? Because this is God's heart. Yeah. So, yeah, man. Come on. It's so good, and that that all entails with becoming a son of God, becoming the mature sons of God that the creation is longing for. It's in the context of crying, "Abba, Father," alone, but then together, we cry, the cry, the cry of our hearts to be, to see, to know the Father and to be known, and then to make Him known. And in, in, in the context of family, so good, man. That was much. <laughs> that was so good. Do you guys have any questions? I don't know uh, who's watching, but. Thank you guys for watching. Uh, that was just yeah. a, a snippet of what we're just going to let loose on in Portland, Oregon in two weeks from now, April 19th through the 21st. We're going to be talking about covenant relationships. We're going to be talking about how Jesus reigns over communities. Yeah. God's de like God's desire, my, like God's desire to reign over people. I think that that's what he's been looking for throughout mm -hmm. all the Old Testament we see that Jesus is looking for a people, God is looking for a people that will submit themselves unto his, his kingship, under his reign, yeah. and, uh, and then that he would reign through them in that way. And so we're, we're so excited. We'll be talking about discipleship and pouring into others, how you form communities through life-on-life -life relationship, but then just discipleship, passing it on. We'll be talking about even some practicals about hearing God's voice. Um, we'll be talking about even different dynamics of how, how to allow the Holy Spirit to even move and facilitate gatherings, how to operate as a body, how to function, how to identify different functions of the body within your community. We'll just yeah. be teaching these different elements. And but most of all, I think like Paul said, you know, in Romans, I, I desire to come to you to impart a spiritual gift. And this is with our, our heart in, in even coming to Portland, it's not too like say we're better. It's to say, well, on the other side of the country, God's done something that I believe Portland needs and so it happened so that I was born in Portland I have a brother that lives there he invited us out I want to bless his community and any any others involved in that God is on the move in, in our country in our cities and we want to be part of it together even uh, but we want to take a like we want to have a mentality that yeah we're part of a move of God but even within our own communities back at home a move of God looks like family. A move of God looks like lives being knit together where God can descend and have his way through the, a, a people that are molded by his presence. So yeah, we're so excited. <laughs> we're so excited to come. So thank you guys for watching. I appreciate you guys sticking around. And um, yeah, be on the lookout for more. And yeah, like, share, and send this video out. So love you guys. Bless you guys. And yes. grace and peace. Like. It doesn't matter how developed your personal intimacy is. Intimacy and identity will never exempt you from family. Yeah. But that's what we believe, is that if we can become developed enough in identity and intimacy, mm -hmm. in a singular, isolated way, that God will somehow bypass His desire to refine me by family. But that's why family is the validation of mm -hmm. what you have claimed to receive by identity. Mm -hmm. Because until yeah. you have to live it out in a relational context, wow. and it's tested by real relationship and other folks, yeah. you can claim to have received whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Like, 
I can claim to be the most patient person in the world mm -hmm. until I get into real relationship. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. real relationship built off of diversity, strategically designed to develop family, is the greatest testing place yeah. of everything that I claim. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because, like, unless, what, what, do I, what am I doing? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, bro, anybody could just claim whatever they want and say whatever they want and then just take off running yeah. in calling or activity, yeah. which is what happens most times, you know? But.